Chapter 4 Franz Ferdinand Ask someone who was part of Gamergate what it was about, and you'll almost certainly hear about ethics in games journalism and censorship issues. If you ask someone against it, or uninvolved, and you'll likely hear something about harassment, trolling, cyberbullying, and perhaps some waffle about the alt-right or Trump. If you hear anything about ethics or censorship from those people, it will be in a scornful and dismissive tone, as though this was never what it was about. Slightly more sophisticated critics will likely describe an entirely spurious but compelling scenario about white cis-het male rejection of women and minorities invading their hobby. So, how is it that we have this enormous gulf between how Gamergate sees itself, how it's perceived by its enemies, and how it has been portrayed in the mainstream and games media? If it is this repressive, regressive, reactionary, right-wing movement, how is it that its members are so diverse and primarily left liberal in political standing? If it is this alt-right Trumpist troll nest, how is it that I, a left anarchist, militant egalitarian, and anti-censorship activist, would be involved with it? To understand that gap in perception, you don't only have to know the background of moral panics and the zeitgeist in which Gamergate took place, you have to understand how Gamergate started. For that reason, it's important to talk about Zoe Quinn, Depression Quest, Erin Journey, and the Zoe Post, even though none of those things mean that much in and of themselves when it comes to Gamergate. Underlining that last point is important. Gamergate was not about Zoe Quinn, nor limited to Zoe Quinn. Gamergate's detractors often try to make it all about the harassment of women, and about Zoe Quinn in particular, ignoring the broader, historical, and contemporaneous issues. Quinn's shenanigans and the fuss around them was only the starting point. Zoe Quinn and Depression Quest Zoe Quinn is a kinda, sorta indie game developer. The main reason for which she is known, besides being a victim of Gamergate, is her game Depression Quest. Depression Quest is nothing special. It's a text game that is supposed to, in some ways, replicate the experiences involved in being depressed. This is meant to help foster understanding and to educate people on those issues, which is a step up from I don't have to educate you shitlord. Apparently she had some previous history, some things that had gone on before, which earned some ire, but it is through Depression Quest that Quinn became visible, known, and began to attract serious dislike from gamers. You see, Depression Quest isn't a game. It's less of a game than something like Oregon Trail, even though both are educational. It's also merely a text game, with very limited inputs. I've tried my hand at this and made a game in an afternoon in the same way. Depression Quest began to get attention and plaudits well before Gamergate became a thing. This was done, arguably, at the expense of projects that were more genuinely games, as gamers understand it, and were more complex, more accomplished, and more deserving. My previous support I used to be a supporter and booster of Zoe Quinn. As late as August in 2014, when things were starting to go south around her, I was suspicious of the accusations and somewhat supportive. As a depressive, I had welcomed the significant profile of Depression Quest in creating conversations about depression. While flawed, the game was useful in trying to get friends and family to understand what depression was like for me. It helped them empathise with what I was going through and why I got so withdrawn. I was grateful and unaware of the controversy that was already around her. When Quinn was mugged at the beginning of 2014, I donated to help her out. When she got trolled and attacked pre-Gamergate, I offered some words of support. I let her know Depression Quest had helped me in getting people to understand it. It wasn't until her scandals began to hit that I questioned my support, and whether I had been acting on behalf of a good person or not. It turned out she wasn't much of a good person. I'd been fooled. Zoe's bad actions. I wish I could just skip over Quinn and all her dealings, as she is only the spark that set off a chain of events that culminated in Gamergate. 
It is important, however, in my estimation, to establish that she is not some passive victim, and that her scandals and the reactions to them did not come out of nowhere. I was not even familiar with much of this until things began to snowball, and uncovering all of these things established a more compelling picture of a pattern of behaviour. Quinn's dishonesty and manipulation appears to have a rather long history. Wizard Chan While trying to get Depression Quest onto Steam, a download service, Quinn came in for a lot of stick, trolling and downvoting. You'd need to have some level of approval to be allowed onto the platform. At the height of this process, she claimed to be getting harassment on her phone and elsewhere of a more serious nature. She chose to blame an image board called Wizard Chan, inhabited almost entirely by socially anxious, virginal men. There were precisely two posts on that board mentioning her, which, while rather nasty, made no call for brigading and were rather just discussing the game. There was no evidence of any brigading, no evidence it started on Wizard Chan, but this site ended up getting a lot of attention and harassment in turn. Given the mentally damaged and desperate nature of many of the posters there, this was probably far more impactful than the trolling Quinn had received. On the back of that trolling and high-profile support from key figures in the burgeoning social justice gaming community, Depression Quest was greenlit and went up onto Steam, despite being, essentially, a little web page based text clicking game. Now it's important to note that I'm not saying that there was a conspiracy here. All I think there is is irresponsibility, hypocrisy and the establishment and continuation of a pattern of behaviour. We can see here the value and power of being a victim. We can also see the willingness of people to believe a harassment narrative, so long as it comes from a woman, without evidence. We can also see how the negative image of a group, such as Wizard Chan, renders them villains, even when they're the ones being attacked, and the ones who are vulnerable. Hell Dump Quinn was an active participant in a board on the site Something Awful, called Hell Dump. This was a board dedicated to trolling, doxing, and online harassment. Supposedly they, the board, rather than Quinn individually, had a confirmed kill. That is to say, it's claimed and supposed that they had succeeded in harassing someone to the point of suicide. There have been numerous attempts to minimise and excuse this, to misrepresent what Helldump was, but Gamergate members were attacked and excoriated for far less. So there is, at the very least, a problem of consistency. She does appear to have been active under the name Eris. She confessed to being a part of it, and even if it doesn't amount to much, she was at least implicitly guilty of doing all the things she would later condemn. The Fine Young Capitalists The Fine Young Capitalists were, are, a somewhat radical feminist group determined to support women in gaming and to get more women into gaming as a whole. To that end, they organised various events, including a game jam intended to highlight and assist female developers in gaining skills and experience. They ended up entangled with Quinn after someone mistakenly took them for being transphobic. Quite how you set a line and police someone's genuine female or trans-female status, I do not know. Quinn's circle, and Quinn herself, took to trying to sabotage their project by that misunderstanding. According to TFYC themselves, they had immense trouble getting publicity and backing due to sabotage by Quinn and her friends. Outlets, sites and individuals had been warned away. Horrible things had been said about them. Their site was taken down by an attack. They tried to counter things as best they could, but it seemed they were tainted by the spurious transphobic attack. The disapproval of someone like Quinn, whose profile was still increasing, gave them little room to manoeuvre or be heard. In the end, a rather unlikely group, Slash V from 4chan, came to their rescue, donating the money they needed to finish their project and birthing Vivian James in the process. Gamergate would continue to support and boost TFYC well into Gamergate, through to the final execution of their project. A band of supposed misogynists and harassers helping a feminist group to get women in games because they were attacked by women in games. This doesn't exactly fit the narrative of sexist harassers. Polaris Game Jam the Polaris Game Jam was an effort between Polaris and Maker Studios to create a kind of reality show around games programming and creation. 
There were some reasons it fell apart, but part of the blame and the cost lies with Zoe Quinn, who self-admittedly set out to cause it problems. YouTubers and other games figures were also pulled into the problems and dragged down with the ensuing failure. Whether Polaris would have succeeded otherwise, we don't know. It had plenty of other problems, but deliberate sabotage certainly cannot have helped it. Of particular note concerning Polaris and TFYC, Quinn ended up taking money for and promoting her own game jam, the Rebel Game Jam, which never materialised. None of these elements make any real odds as to whether she deserved to be trolled, harassed or abused. That's not the suggestion here. Rather, this is to point out that this is no innocent victim. Quinn dished out much of what she ended up taking, was hypocritical about it, and there were lots of people who already had reasons to dislike Quinn. Victim blaming or not, I think it's less surprising that horrible people saying and doing horrible things get flack, even if perfectly lovely people do too. The Zoe Post In August of 2014, Erin Joni, at that point Zoe Quinn's ex-boyfriend, posted The Zoe Post up as a blog. For somewhat inexplicable reasons, this caught the public imagination within the gaming community. This was possibly due to pre-existing hostility towards Quinn over her non-game and her actions within the community. She had also been cashing in on the growing social justice attacks on gaming. Whatever the reason, Joni's rather intimate breakup blog got spread all over the internet, along with all of its salacious details. Once it hit 4chan, it was all over. There was no stopping it. When you read the post itself, it is obviously and self-evidently the long-winded catharsis of a heartbroken man, a man betrayed by his lover and, frankly, abused by her. By her definitions contained within screenshots and logs in the blogs, she raped him. Her behaviour seems consistently psychologically abusive, though of course this is a biased sample from an antagonistic blog. Her ambition and other factors appear to have led her, in particular, to sleep with a total of five different men behind Aaron's back. Some have tried to portray his actions in outing her as slut-shaming or somehow indefensible. Many of us, however, do consider Aaron to be a victim of abuse and an example of how there is a double standard around such issues for men. If a woman had written this kind of post about a man cheating on and abusing her, the reception would have been much different. What Erin did is no different to what many women have done without much in the way of blowback. Warning people away from abusive exes or potentially dangerous men is seen as a service to the community. Not so much vice versa. Rapist lists with no backing, just open accusation, have even been circulated at universities with little pushback or acrimony. Warn fellow women about men without any evidence, accusing them of being sex criminals, and you're a folk hero. Inform fellow men about an abusive woman with copious evidence and references, and you're a folk villain. There ain't no justice, as the saying goes. Further, Joni ended up being gagged by a court order imposed by Quinn, making him unable to talk about the Zoe post or its surrounding issues. This was considered a violation of Joni's First Amendment rights by several legal observers, and would have made a good test case if Quinn hadn't dropped her case, and Joni had been able to continue. Needless to say, this activated the interest of a lot of free speech advocates, and coupled with the abuse involved in the case, also engaged a lot of men's human rights activists, as well as gamers. All of the legal wranglings are, frankly, beyond me, and it never made it to court anyway, as the case it was tied in with was dropped and dismissed. There was no stomach within the legal system to take such a case forward purely for setting a precedent about First Amendment rights. If you want to learn more, there is a Reddit thread that goes into detail and references the whole process. Whatever you think of the Zoe post and whether it was misogynistic or whatever else, the information within it did reveal corruption and a lack of journalistic ethics. That's not contestable. Five Guys and Quinspiracy Initially, of course, what garnered people's attention was the sex scandal. Joni did not come off any better from that than Quinn did, being cheated on with five guys led to some early adopters overusing the term cuck that is now unfortunately so familiar to us all. At least at the time they were using it in something closer to its original meaning. P. 
People put a lot of effort into figuring out who the five guys were. The correlation with the burger restaurant of the same name led to a lot of memes at the expense of Quinn and her indoor football team of lovers. Five Guys was primarily just this, making fun of the tawdry sexual escapades. It was gossip, it was uncharitable, mean, but not anything to be too concerned over. Quinspiracy, on the other hand, a term coined apparently by a YouTuber internet aristocrat, currently Mr. Mitika, was something a little more. When you understand who Quinn's alleged lovers were, it becomes somewhat more apparent as to why this would upset and concern people. Guy won. Brandon McMartin, a sound engineer at an indie games company, Polytron. Guy 2, Kyle Pulver, a lead developer at indie games company, Retro Effect. Guy 3, Nathan Grayson, a games journalist, writing for Kotaku and previously Rock Paper Shotgun. Guy 4, Robin Arnott, another sound engineer and indie games developer. Guy 5, Joshua Boggs, co-founder of Quinn's employer at the time, Love Shack and allegedly married, just to add some spice to the tale. Only three of these are concrete, two are speculative based on examination of screenshots, but the most important one is Nathan Grayson, and that one is confirmed. This was tawdry, perhaps, a little squalid, there were plenty of things for people to make fun of, and maybe a few destroyed relationships, not to mention the creation of some trust issues. Still, other than making fun of it, so what? These are the kinds of people you might expect someone to have an affair with, people moving in the same circles, work colleagues, and so on. No big whoop, right? Except for Nathan Grayson. Grayson was a journalist. Grayson had covered Quinn glowingly in three articles without disclosing their relationship. This was a clear-cut and obvious breach of journalistic ethics, and far from the only lapse on Grayson's part. Now there was something with some meat on its bones. Now it wasn't just a sex scandal and cuckoldry to be laughed at. Now it was a failure in journalistic integrity, an explanation as to why non-games were getting so much publicity, and an opportunity to strike back at the censors and critics. It demonstrated that the holier-than-thou indies and their boosters were just as corrupt as the big companies and news outlets. Censorship both the Five Guys initial sex scandal and the resulting conspiracy that came after it were heavily censored, even by sites you wouldn't normally expect to be censor-happy. These included, but were not limited to, 4chan, the Depression Quest forum, The Escapist, Kotaku's comment sections, N4G, NeoGAF, Reddit, Games and Gaming, YouTube, and comments on Vice. This raised hackles due to the anti-censorship nature of internet culture, and the fact that, to many, it seemed to indicate collusion. This was later to be confirmed. And bias. Censorship and suppression of the first aspect, the sex scandal, might have been somewhat excusable, but as the media scandal unfolded, it became unreasonable. Without the censorship, things would likely have blown over. They would probably have been limited to the scandal and corruption as it directly related to Quinn and nothing more. As a result of the censorship, more energy and outrage was pumped into the system, more trust was broken with the mainstream games media, and more attention was paid to what was going on in the background. The censorship issue would go on to inflame and dog Gamergate. It created an enormous bias, with Gamergate being unable to defend itself in standard media spaces, or even in the comments section of articles made to attack it. It contributed to a useless and biased Wikipedia article, a media two minutes hate against Gamergate. It helped create a straw man of a group that, for all the shitposting and bad taste humour, had genuine and pressing concerns about media ethics and censorship. These concerns were not helped by that self-same media continuing to be unethical and engaging in censorship around Gamergate. The silencing tactics apparently intended to prevent a witch hunt, but they all but created Gamergate and helped turn it into a general investigation and counter-outrage at social justice and the game's media. Gamergate's enemies are the ones who made it a thing and who kept it going. They've even periodically brought it back to life. In the words of the meme, congratulations, you played yourself. Gamergate So far, we still haven't gotten to Gamergate, but there is a chain of events here that lead up to it. The spark that ignites the fire 
that would become Gamergate is the Five Guys Burgers and Fries scandal. This in turn became the conspiracy with its attendant censorship and rising suspicion. This still wasn't Gamergate. Gamergate started after the YouTuber Mundane Matt was censored. Internet Aristocrat did a video about Quinn, and Hollywood star Adam Baldwin tweeted out that video accompanied by the hashtag Gamergate on August the 27th. That video was and is a good place to see the collected irritation and concerns that were to emerge throughout Gamergate. This almost exactly coincided with the emergence of what have come to be known as the Gamers Are Dead articles, a rather suspicious series of articles from many supposed game sites denigrating their audience and proclaiming the end of the gamer identity. This was as suspicious to gamers as the coordinated censorship, and in time it was proven to originate in a secret journalist email list, Game Journal Pros. More information on this later. This was a shocking, coordinated attack by games journalism, which was increasingly under scrutiny, against their ostensible audience. Little wonder they would seek to protect their skin, but it was blatant, open, ideological and disgusting. Outlets involved were Ars Technica, BuzzFeed, The Daily Beast, Destructoid, The Financial Post, Gama Sutra, three times, Games O Net, Girl Guardian, Kotaku, Polygon, Rock Paper Shotgun, VG247, Vice, and more. The games community's concern about corruption and ethics were brushed off and censored. Their concerns about censorship were themselves censored. The very outlets that should have been looking into these issues and addressing their audience's concerns turned on them. They bent the mainstream media into a false narrative of misogyny, sexism and harassment right from the get-go. Gamers were even more outraged by this slander and marginalisation. This was now war. It's been called misogynistic, racist, a hate group, reactionary. It's been blamed for Trump for keeping women out of games and technology. None of this is true. If you want the real story, then you need to buy Inside Gamergate.